chapter 4. We'll read the whole chapter, which will also be our text for this morning. So if we've been uh, following the story. We know that uh, Naomi has come back to Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, having lost to death her uh, husband and two sons. They have come back in abject poverty, both widows, and uh, to make matters worse, Ruth being a, uh, uh, a non-Israelite of who would be considered a heathen or a pagan in that nation. Um, they have been found in a very desperate situation. Naomi even calls herself bitter, but the Lord is faithful. We've seen that again and again in the story, and uh, he has brought Boaz into their lives, and we left off with the uh, the proposition we said of Ruth to Boaz to marry her and be their kinsman redeemer, and uh, we'll see how things unfold and how the story ends marvelously this morning. Ruth chapter 4, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging, to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Machlon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Our song of preparation is number 323, O Little Town of Bethlehem. We've been uh, studying about and being, uh, having it recalled to our minds over and over about this all happening in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And so let's uh, sing number 323. Let's rise to sing all the four stanzas, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Once again, congregation, if you're able to, please keep your Bibles open to Ruth 4 as we walk through this passage this morning. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are many people in this world who are going to be very disappointed today, and especially this morning. And I say this from experience, having come out of a pagan world and into Christianity, so I've walked this walk. There are many people today who have listened to all the Christmas songs being played on the radio, jingle bells and walking in a winter wonderland and sleigh bells and uh, chestnuts roasting on an opening, open fire and all of this. And it kind of fills you with this sentimentality and this longing for something, something some kind of a joy that you find you're missing that maybe, maybe is only going to come your way on Christmas Day. And people have watched all the traditional television Christmas movies, you know, The Miracle on 34th Street and The Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life, and they've been pumped up and excited once again about this magic of the holiday season that they keep hearing about year after year after year. And they're going to awake this morning and they're going to run downstairs and they're going to tear open all their presents, which will give them pleasure for all of five minutes. And then there's going to come that hollowness, that emptiness. Where is this Christmas magic that we heard about and we look forward to? Where is the joy that we were promised? Where is the joy that we were supposed to experience today? And so once again, they'll try to drown out the disappointment in Granddad's special eggnog and hope that maybe the Boxing Day specials, the sales, will fill the void and congregation, but for the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, we would be in the, in the same cycle of despair. It is by His grace, by His mercy and compassion that we instead woke up this morning, not thinking about the presents under the tree or the money that we'll get from Grandma or the new waffle maker that we want to try out. By God's grace, our thoughts were turned to a little town in ancient Judea where many years ago the Savior of the world was born. Our hearts, by God's grace again, our hearts were filled with joy at the thought of what this meant for the world. This was the Savior who would bring us redemption, uh, salvation. And our joy this morning is not modeled after a rejuvenated Ebenezer Scrooge, but after a restored widow one, we're talking about Naomi here, who was lifted to the heights of joy, who was before plunged into helplessness and hopelessness. Now, we said at the beginning of this series that Naomi and Ruth are pictures of the church, the people of God, in the sense that they are miserable, they're wretched, they're helpless, they're in need of redemption, just like us. We said Naomi is a a widow without a husband and any sons to take care of her in her old age in a male-dominated culture. Ruth is a widow in a foreign land. But what we've seen so far in this book again and again is the unfailing love of God to those in despair, his faithfulness to his covenant people, his dedication to his promise of redemption. And we'll see this all come together this morning in Ruth 4 as we look at this final chapter. We can summarize what we learn here in this chapter with this theme, the Lord provides redemption in the house of bread. The Lord provides redemption in the house of bread. And boys and girls, again, uh, here's one of those big words that we uh, use, but maybe we don't know what it means. Redemption comes from the word redeem. The redeem means to buy back. And so if someone is sold or lost or they're being held hostage, and someone pays what needs to be paid to get them back, to free them, they have been redeemed, okay? Christ is our Redeemer. He's bought us back. And that's the big picture that we want to keep in mind here this morning. Well, chapter 3 ended with Naomi and Ruth being content to wait. Naomi says to Ruth, Boaz will not rest until the matter is settled this day. And chapter 4 begins by Boaz making good on his promise. This next scene, or act, finds him going up to the city gate. And the city gate, we know from various parts of the Bible, is the place where all the big transactions took place. At the city go gates uh, sat the elders of the city, the most respected men of the city, the wise ones of the city, and who they witnessed 
the changing of hands when it came to land and other business and social activities all took place in the presence of the elders at the gate. Here is where Boaz sat, waiting for the other close relative, the other kinsman redeemer, the Goel, we've said in the Hebrew, waiting for him to pass by. And pass by he did. The sense of the Hebrew is that he was not planning to sit down at the city gate. He was on his way to do his own business. And here again, as we've said, we get a glimpse into the character of this other kinsman redeemer. There's not a hint of any concern, and it's not by accident that the inspired writer states it this way, but there is not a hint of any concern on his part for his two widowed relatives, one an old woman, one a foreigner. He had no concern that an Israelite family, one of his own relatives, was about to be erased from the nation of Israel. And so no wonder the inspired writer does not even extend to him the courtesy of naming him. Now, our NKJVs is very nice and polite, and they have Boaz addressing him as friend. The, the Hebrew doesn't say that. The Hebrew actually uses a slang term that might be translated whatever, whoever, so-and-so. Now, Bo Boaz, of course, would have known this man's name and addressed him as such, but the writer, the inspired writer, deliberately withholds this man's name, in a sense, drawing a line through it. Ironically, he who had no concern for Elimelech's name ends up without a name himself. Anyway, Boaz catches this unnamed near relative of Elimelech as he's heading out to do his business in his own world, and he seats him down at the gate. And then Boaz sets up a, a legal assembly, ten elders. We don't know why ten, but ten being a picture of fullness in the Bible. And he puts them to sit down to witness the transactions. The main thing we have to understand here is that this was a legal proceeding. And things could now proceed legally. And the eventual outcome of this, even though these were just words being spoken here and a sandal coming off and whatever, this would be, the outcome of this would be legal and binding. Even if it was, as if it was like a 20-page contract. And so in the presence of the elders, Boaz turns to the nearer kinsman, Redeemer, once again. Now, the writer, as we said, wields his pen marvelously, and he has us on the edge, and there are questions in our minds and anticipations, and we want certain things to happen. And so we're expecting Boaz, in light of chapter 3, to jump right into a discussion of Ruth, because that's where we left off, right? Right? After the scene at the threshing floor, we were, we were eager to see these two married because we said they're, they're so perfectly matched. Both Boaz and Ruth are honorable, upstanding, caring, God-fearing. And, and we saw Ruth make a very specific request, a marriage proposal to Boaz. And so we're very eager as readers of this story to, to see Boaz make good on his promise. Until we, we continue reading, and, and, and what, what does Boaz start talking about? Land. In verses 3 to 4, he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. Now, in these words, some new light is shed on the situation. Naomi and Ruth's redemption doesn't merely consist of a husband for Ruth and an heir for Elimelech. Some new light comes to life here. The land of Elimelech needs to be redeemed as well. Now, the NKJV again says, uh, it says sold, that, uh, the land that Naomi has sold, it's, uh, literally in the Hebrew, it's is selling. She, she's, it's up for sale. And so Boaz here is taking care of, of this land that belonged really to his relative Elimelech. And in a sense, he's, he's interested in the complete welfare of Naomi and Ruth. Now, apparently Naomi still owned the land of Elimelech, but was in no position to work it. She was old, we've said, and she was penniless. And according to Old Testament law, the nearest relative was obligated to help them in this situation. You can hear, um, there are many passages where this is talked about, but um, we'll, 
read specifically Leviticus 25, verse 25 here. And this is the instruction that God gave to his people through Moses. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. So in Old Testament times, we have to understand, first of all, let's paint the picture here. In Old Testament times, land was not an insignificant thing. It was critically important to everyone. A man's land was a sign that he belonged to the covenant people of God. Today we can buy and sell land. It means nothing. It has no sentimental value to us. In Old Testament times, when Israel lived in the land of Canaan, the former land of Canaan, owning land was a sign that they belonged to the covenant people of God. This was the inheritance that God gave to his people when he brought them across the river Jordan into the land of Canaan. And he drove out the pagan nations from before them, and he says, this land I allot to you, this land I give to you, to the families of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the land was given to them with the understanding that it was to remain with them, remain their possession permanently. There were even times like the, the day of Jubilee and so on where even if you had lost your land, you could get it back and so on because it always had to remain in your family's possession. Just one example of how serious people took this. Think of uh, Naboth. Remember when uh, Naboth, boys and girls, King Ahab come, came to him and said, sell me your vineyard um, and uh, I'll pay you you know, quite lavishly for it or whatever. What was Naboth's response to King Ahab? He said, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So land was very, very important. It was tied to your relationship with God. And so not only was Naomi in need of a redeemer to carry on the name of her husband, she needed one to secure his land as well to make sure that Elimelech's land was not lost and given into somebody else's hands. And so Boaz begins with the land. Naomi needs to sell this land. And he sees it as his duty to bring it to the attention to the nearer relative of Naomi's intentions. And up to now, we've been just waiting for, for Boaz and, and uh, for, for it to be announced that Boaz and Ruth are going to be married and live happy ever, happily ever after. And then we hear this very disappointing response from the nearer kinsman redeemer. Don't want to hear it, but he says, I will redeem it. Now, why does he say so quickly, I will redeem it? Because in his mind, now his wheels are turning, things are clicking, and this, in his mind, was a good investment. Can't lose here. Financially, buying this land is an investment without any risk. There were, there were no heirs to Elimelech. Elimelech is dead, his sons are dead. Nobody is going to come along at some point and reclaim this property. It's going to be mine, mine, mine. Even the year of Jubilee, at which time land reverted to the original owners, was no threat because there would be no original owners alive anyway to which the land could go back. And so this was a steal of a deal in his mind. A small investment now, enlarge my own inheritance, and ching, ching, productive, profitable harvests, money, money, money. This unnamed relative was a classic example of a man who believed in dollars, not deeds. And he was about to show his colors. In verses 5 and 6, we read, Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, let's be clear on one thing. Technically, there was no Old Testament law that stated that the one who redeems the property of a relative was obligated to also marry his widow. The Mosaic law, and we saw this in Deuteronomy 25 last time, applied to brothers living together and involved the raising up of an heir for a dead brother. The law of Leviticus 25 applied to pulling a relative out of financial hardship so that he wouldn't lose his land. Technically, these were two very separate laws. But seeing that the nearer relative raises no objections, we have to conclude that customs existed in that time that obligated him to do this. These were not legal but moral obligations. 
They were voluntary, but at the same time, binding and legal. As Boaz demonstrated in chapter 2, the law of God was never meant to spell out every single principle and application. God's people were never meant to rest with the bare minimum, just the letter of the law. They were to seek ways to apply this law to their lives for the good of their fellow man. In this case, redeeming Naomi meant more than merely buying her land. It meant also restoring her husband's name. Now, normally, the Redeemer would buy the land, he would marry the widow, he would take care of the land, and then hand it over to the first son born to them as a couple. Here's a funny twist on this. Ruth the, My the Moabitess is acquired here. Now, again, um, the NKJV talks about buying and buying from Ruth. It, it says uh, literally in the Hebrew that uh, Ruth the Moabitess will be acquired. When you buy this land, you acquire Ruth the Moabitess. She's referred to by Boaz here as the wife of the dead. The wife of the dead. What, what in the world is going on here? Well, Boaz is clarifying the mat, uh, all the matters here. Naomi cannot fulfill the duty of bearing a child to carry out or carry on her husband's name, but there's someone who can, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And so if we were to paraphrase, put in our own words uh, what Boaz is saying here to the nearer kinsman redeemer, it would sound something like this. Listen, on the day you redeem the land from Naomi, you also require Ruth, the widow of Elimelech's son, and you are then entitled, you have to, you're obligated to raise up a son, an heir for Elimelech. In other words, Ruth is going to serve as a stand-in, a substitute for Naomi. She will do for Naomi what Naomi is, what, what is impossible for Naomi to do for herself. And in this way, the name of Elimelech would be perpetuated, says the NKJV. The, the Hebrew says resurrected or raised up. The name of Elimelech would be raised up and continued. And you see, as we've said, without an ear, the name of Elimelech would at some point cease to exist. His name and his family would disappear. But Ruth would fix that. She would bear a son to continue Elimelech's name and she would thereby secure his land, his inheritance, forever. Well, at this news, the unnamed relative re-examines his options and decides, well, maybe this is not such a good, a good idea after all. He cannot redeem this property. The reason he say, gives is, but, is that he might ruin or endanger, literally destroy or corrupt his own estate in verse 6. Suffice it to say that he was not willing to invest in the purchase of the land, the care of the land, take care of Naomi and Ruth, and then at some point down, uh, a few years down the road see his investment disappear if a son was born to Ruth. The financial loss would have been too much. And so he hands over his right to redeem to Boaz. And to properly legalize everything, he removes his sandal and gives it to Boaz. This is another Old Testament custom that we don't find attested anywhere, at least um, to, 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 to legalize contracts and so on. But the, what we need to understand here is that as surely as Boaz held that sandal, so surely was his right to redeem Elimelech's land and marry Ruth. This was a binding contract here. It was, there also seemed to be the matter of of stating exactly what was bought and announcing your intentions, which Boaz does. And then there was the final legalizing of the transaction where the elders announce that they are witnesses and they then bless Ruth and Boaz. And what a blessing they give to Ruth and Boaz. They compare Ruth, in fact, to Rachel and Leah, Jacob's wives, who together built up the house of Israel. In other words, their blessing was for the womb of Ruth to be fruitful. And let's not miss the comparison of Ruth to Tamar. Tamar, like Ruth, was a foreigner. And yet she, like Ruth, honored the name of the dead, making great personal sacrifice to continue the line of Judah. And she too is called righteous. 
Well, in verses 13 and following, the scene now again switches from promises made at the gate to promises fulfilled. Boaz, true to his word, marries Ruth, and the Lord blesses them with a son. And now Naomi returns to the spotlight. The widow who had renamed herself bitter, who saw herself afflicted by God, who said that I had gone away full and come back empty, at least in her opinion at that time, we now read this of her, verses 14 to 15. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. So the, the, townswomen, the townwomen recognize that life has been restored to Naomi. They praise God that he has given her a kinsman redeemer, a close relative. Who is this re redeemer that, that Naomi has been given? Well, the women announce it. Your daughter-in-law, who is better to you, that, to you than seven sons, has borne him. And so Naomi's rede redeemer is the child, the son, born to Ruth. Ruth Ruth's child was reckoned to, as Naomi's son. And the inspired writer records that this boy child is placed on Naomi's bosom, symbolizing that he was now her husband's legitimate heir, and she cared for him. And the women of the town named him Obed. Obed in the Hebrew means servant. Well named, because he would fulfill the role of servant to his grandmother in her old age, and he would even serve his dead grandfather by carrying on his grandfather's name. And so the Lord had provided redemption for Naomi in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And the last image we get here is of Naomi holding her grandson. She held and she cared for this tiny baby born to be her redeemer. And as soon as we say that, our minds leap forward into history to a young girl named Mary in the same little town named Bethlehem. And she too held and cared for a baby who would grow up to be not only her redeemer, but the redeemer of the world. In Matthew 1, we find the genealogy of Jesus. And uh, listen to verse, just, we're not going to read the whole thing, just verses 5 to 7 and then verse 16. We read in Matthew 1, 5 to 7, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot David the king, David the king begot Solomon by her who had been wife of Uriah, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and it goes on down the line till we come to verse 16. We read, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus who is called Christ. And so Obed was not the end of the story. He was not the end goal, as it were. He was the continuation. God was working, bringing about his greater purpose. He intervened even in the, e the evil days of the judges to bring a righteous woman and man together. Boaz and Ruth provide the continuation, the perpetuation of a covenant family in Israel. But in the process, God was preserving the bloodline that would eventually produce Christ Jesus, the Redeemer of sinners. The genealogy in Ruth 4 ends with David, son of Jesse of Bethlehem. But in Matthew 1, we see the continuation of that bloodline all through Old Testament history. And when the time had fully come, God's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be born. Once again, the Lord would provide redemption in Bethlehem, the house of bread. We hear in Micah 5 that out of Bethlehem Ephrathah would come one who would be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The Son of God, who existed ex eternally with the Father, would come. He would be made flesh to redeem the people walking in darkness. In Isaiah 9, we heard that he should be called the Son of God, mighty counselor, prince of peace, 
This is the one who came into the world. He came to be our redeemer. He would come to secure our inheritance. And what's our inheritance? The new heavens and the new earth. And to make us heirs of God's kingdom, to make us children of the living God, to make sure that our names do not disappear from the earth. And in the town of David, Bethlehem, the house of bread, the Savior would be born, who is Christ the Lord. He would come not to relieve us merely from physical poverty, but spiritual misery. Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, verse 14, that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. He writes to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 7, that in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is what we celebrate on this Christmas morning, that God blessed us with the gift of the promised Redeemer. When we were sold in sin, in bondage to the dominion of darkness, wretched and miserable, without hope, strangers and aliens to God, our Redeemer came, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law. And congregation, may this good news, these glad tidings, be our comfort and joy this morning on this Christmas day. May the peace and blessing of the Prince of Peace be ours today and always because the joy that he brings never disappoints and delivers what it promises, a joy that is full and enduring. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have led the church and directed us that we may remember the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have recorded it. You sp the, the prophets spoke of it. The apostles connected it to our salvation. And Father, we thank you that we may know this word and believe it. And it may give us joy in our hearts and comfort, knowing that if Jesus had not been born into this world, we would remain in our sins. We would be lost. We would have no relationship with you. We would have no hope of being in your kingdom, in the new heavens and the new earth. Thank you for what you have done, for the covenant line that you preserved all through history. Thank you for the Savior, and thank you for giving us faith in him. We pray that, again, this message would so fill us that it may shine from us as we live our lives in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.